Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Red Dusk. I'm your host, Mr. Union of Soviet Socialist Republics lover. But B Boris Pugo, elected as the General Secretary of the CPSU. Today, the government of the Soviet Union has announced that the 10th leader of the USSR, a new General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, is a former Minister of the Interior, Boris Pugo, having earned his respect both from the CPSU, the public, and the KGB. Pugo was one of the strongest candidates to win the party's vote. Many believe that he's already begun consolidating his position. With the support of the KGP, he might bring the USSR to a new golden age. Some observers speculate that Pugo, having an orthodox outlook in the party, will return the Soviet Union to the days of Yuri Andropov, or even Joseph Stalin. What does it come will most certainly affect the internal situation in the USSR? More of the same, it seems. Um, also, if I mispronounce any words, I apologize. But you should know that by now, that I'm definitely going to be uh, mispronouncing things. I'll prepare how to deal with our enemies later on, as attacking them will prepare only weaken us. And then tying up loose ends. Gorbachev is a traitor to the motherland that has been tolerated by the Union for far too long. His deeds and actions brought to it the brink of collapse. He deserves nothing more than a bullet who will stomp out the Krakrush. New guard. Uh, Sergei was being led around the courtyard of the Kremlin into the main gate by the new superior officer, Anatoly. He couldn't really put his mind at ease, but then again, he would. He was now part of the Kremlin Guard Unit, one of the many that were here not just to take part in the ceremonial duties, but also to be the security of the highest of the highest of the Union's leadership, truth be told. His position was nothing more than to be a guard of the main entrance and to salute the arriving party officials. And so he took his position in a small post standing right beside the main entrance. Overlooking him on the other side was his appear to Anatoly, who corrected, tots and got the new recruit ready for the future of service. And just as Sergei was thinking that the day couldn't get any more boring, a small column pulled up to the gates. Three black cars with two police motors in front and two in the back. In the back. Just who was an important person that needed this much protection was the first thought that came to Sergei's mind. And just then, as he walked up to the mirror of the first car to check, his eyes widened in surprise as the newly elected General Secretary Boris Pugo. Sergei was at a loss for words, first day of work, and he was already to get to see the most powerful man in the entire union. But as soon as he realized that Pugo and the, ex and the KGB officials who were with him in the car started to look at him, he quickly gave a salute to the men. For his gesture, he got a smile from Pugo and a small chuckle from one of the officials as a column and the Kremlin. What is it, Comrade Sergei? You look like you've seen a ghost. Did Lenin appear out of nowhere and I missed it? And Anatoly chuckled as he asked the new recruit. Eh, yeah, sort of. We need more fuel. Influencing North Korea. With the election of the new premier, we've decided to improve our ties with the North Koreans and eventually get them on our sphere. However, this won't be an easy task. We'll need to direct a good amount of resources to combat the Chinese influence and expand our ties. North Korea will be aligned to us. Ooh, can we do anything with them? Oh my god, yeah. Our overall influence of the nation will determine whatever if they align with us or our opponent, the People's Republic of China. We're using influence points to increase the influence in the, the DPRK. Get more influence points by doing certain decisions. After getting 100 influence in the DP, DPRK, we can risk our influence to get them in a sphere of influence. We have 20 influence and 20, 15 influence points. The PRC has 15 influence and 10 influence points. Secure influence, increase influence. Uh huh. Increase influence by 5. Or. You can wait to get more influence points here, or a way to get more here. <clears throat> Turn our focus to North Korea. We don't need more political power for that. Provide arms to North Korea for command power. Add influence points, lose command power. 15. That's 35 influence points. Wow. The other com political power cost goes way up, though. 20 influence points, 15, 20. Subtracts 10 influence from the People's Republic of China. Ooh, sabotage Chinese interests. I like that one. Maybe we should have waited for that one, though. Whatever. Um. <clears throat> There's much more to be done, so this is the list. A person that sits beside a window in Bugle's office in the Kremlin House. The first among many, but uh, yes, that is what you start with. I want all these people to be taken, either punished or pushed into retirement or taken in front of a court. Pico told the man in a serious voice. It was almost as if he was preparing his whole life for this, but nothing could prepare anyone for the responsibility of fixing that that was the USSR. Truth be told, are you sure that you're ready for this? No bad intentions, but you're a bit old for leading the USSR. The man told Pugo in a way like he wanted to be telling him the obvious. Don't worry about my age, Vladimir. I might not be as young as I was, but I am more than ready to lead this nation out of this mess. After all, I was among those who saved it ten years ago, and I'm not ready to give it up on it now. Bugle answered the man with a serious look on his face. He knew Vladimir didn't mean anything, but he and the entire KGB needed to know that they are here to serve the state first and foremost. I said, sir, I'll take my leave then. Is there anything more that you might need from me, sir? Vladimir asked if he was putting his hand on the doorknob. Just get it done to Vladimir Vladimirovich. Purge enemies of our union. Turn our focus. Hmm. 
Hmm. How much command party can we have in total? 170? That's not bad. Yep. Provide arms. Oh. Rotary grilling, huh? Oh, a little ahead of time, a little time. So this is all ahead of time. It's still to the, the year 2000. <coughs> Radar, uh, armor. How are we doing on armor? Recon vehicles, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles. Well, I could probably use some better tanks. Oopsie. Let's do that one real quick. And then we're actually going to go back and do this one. And do mute instead, yes. And probably get some better guns. And then the main show. We're getting closer and closer with every passing day to cleansing the party of destruction, reaction, destructive reaction, and liberalism. They don't even really suspect it, but it, like, it, it will be like partisans ambushing unprepared soldiers. Death of Gorbachev. As the general secretary was tirelessly working on his document papers, the secretary came in. He soon made his way in front of the Pugo and had him a do documents folder before, rather, coldly saying, apart from the secretary of the KGB. Um, now, a report from the KGP would not mean much to many, but knowing his own orders lately, the General Secretary knew rather well that what had happened. Gorbachev was dead. Now, if they all went to plan, it would be a death from a heart attack. If not, well, there'd be enough evidence to say whatever either way. He stood up, giving his secretary a subtle nod, and simply gesturing to the others. Sitting back down, Bugle continued working on the documents, but it would relieve the enemies of the USSR and the Soviet wave lives were meaning their end. And one way or another, all the others would share the fate of Gorbachev, and through the bullet pill or by water below a bridge, good riddance. Latest news from the Soviet Union have made headlines around the world. Former General Secretary of the CPSU, father of Glasnost and Perestroika, the man to almost shattered the Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, has passed away due to heart attack. Many inside the USSR have paid little to no regard to the past, and they're probably one of the most important Soviet leaders of the past century. The CPSU and Boris Pugo have given no statement on the situation, except expressing condolences to the family that is seized, as per family's wishes. The funeral of Mikhail Gorbachev would be organized by them personally and not by the state. Many outside observers suspect that the sudden death of the late Soviet statesman could be a result of an assassination ordered by the Soviet state, but without any proof, this just remains an empty theory. Whatever the opinions of the people are on the man himself, Mikhail Gorbachev will remain forever as one of the more notable Soviet leaders. If we do this, we get 15 more influence points. Or we could wait and finish some more first. You only get one a day. So... Oh, 20. Now we need five more. Pugo speech. Comrades, I stand before you to address a critical situation or issue threatening the foundation of our party. The insidious infiltration of revisionism and liberalism within our ranks. Uh, we are facing both internal and external, but how can we confront what is beyond our borders? If the Trojan horse remains within. Revisionism. As a dangerous force that seeks to water down and twist the basic tenets of Marxism Leninism. It's like a cunning philosophy in the guise of progressivism concealing our revolutionary aspirations. Krushka. Gorbachev. Yakolov. Of all have something in common, as they wear the masks of moderate approach, thinking that we can reach our goals by means of gradual reform rather than transformation to the roots. But comrades, history has repeatedly shown that bargains only fade away at a revolutionary fire before eventually falling prey to the imperialist Italians. In 1991, those who had once sworn their allegiance to the Lenin's ideals showed their true colors cowardly, opportunistic, imperialist border, boot bootlickers. Another serious menace that has infiltrated deeply into our party is corruption. It devours comrades trusting each other, making them lose faith in unity, impairs honesty within us, and shifts collective interest towards few individuals away from the members we must take. A hardline stance on corruption. Zero tolerance for corruption. Only through strict internal discipline can we root out the scourge of corruption and restore popular trust in our leadership. What are these things that we are required to do? What we need is a purge, an all-encompassing and deep one, because there's nothing worse than a revolution that cannot defend itself. It's not just punishment, it's indispensable for the birth of a party. It makes sure that we are unwavering in our struggle, devoted to our goal and true to our principles. This is now our task. We can and we must accomplish this task under the banner of Lenin and forward of victory. Long live Comrade Pugo. Let the purges begin, though. Uh, we've perfected the ways of successfully purging unnecessary and harmful elements from a party since the 30s, and we'll put that knowledge to the test by starting the purge of the party to rid it of traitorous filth. So what we need, we have no influence points. That's not good. We just need five, because we're at 95. So we only need 15 influence points. And we'll do this right here. Did we get him? Do we still need more attack helicopters? I guess we do, huh? Are you in our sphere? How do we know what's in our sphere? Moscow Accord? 
No, they're not in a faction. Report something. Uh, the 72 hour long interrogation of several party members, as well as investigation of the recent party activities, has compiled information about several severe law breaking actions of the several high ranking, ranking members. They interrogated subjects who have all confessed to partaking in these actions, which include abuse of power, corruption, favoritism, and nepotism. The following actions of KGB have confirmed that these claims of several major infractions of the Soviet law have been made by several party members. The Special Department of the Ministry of Internal Security has noted these prime suspects in the Political Bureau as responsible for the actions. Nikolai Orekov, former chairman of the Council of Ministers and a member of the Political Bureau, accused of corruption and possible work with foreign agencies. Dmitry Timofeyevich Yazov, Minister of, Minister of Defense of the USSR, accused of nepotism and favoritism. Vasily Starodubsky, chairman of the Peasants' Union of the USSR, accused of abuse of power and corruption. The Ministry of Internal Affairs has, in cooperation with the branches of KGB, made a plan of action to deal with these accusations and the suspects. The plan of action awaits the approval of higher authority. Over Report overseen by Redacted. Report received by General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Boris Karlovich Bugo. Approved. Question of the Army. Clear the Politburo. Yeah, you lose a lot of stability, though. But you removed less uh, political power, so. The Politburo has some members that have been found to be either this well scum or just a waste of really valuable space. We'll sweep the Politburo clean in the following weeks. Our man on the job. You lose political power, but you get more political power. Interesting. Uh, Putin is well, a person that can be trusted and as efficient at his job. He'll be the spirit that pierces the heart of our enemies for good. Let's see, Marshal on our side. Yazov's approval. Healing the old relationship. And army. KGB cooperation. Suspend the army purge. Trust them for now. Soviet army under a watchful eye. The unstable truce. Here, no evil. Loyal men in high positions. The army purge. Oh god. Purged army for a full year. Retired Dmitry Yazov. Oh wow. It's weird seeing the names that we've seen in our days here, too. Um, before we do anything else, I do want to see guides. So, I mean, we chose Boris, conservative part. We get Nina Andreeva or Gennady Zyugonov. They favor her. Idealistic. Well, either one, I guess, really. It doesn't really matter to me. Suspended. I kind of want to go with the full purge then. Question of the army? The army is filled with Yazov loyalists. Most of the armed forces are in the hands of the Marshal. Oh, look at this. Uh, Yazov, this makes him a very suspicious element. New area for Romania commences. Oh! Oh, Yazov is here, yes. How about over here? Concealment. Infantry. Recovery rate. I like. Uh, okay, rate. Lenoti Kuznetsov. Kuznetsov, yes. Oh, because we can't do this one until we're done with probably with all this purging and whatnot. A slight purge. Matter of the economy. Completed matter of the military. Oh, Pugo's policies. Oh, there's a lot here. Oh, there's a lot. I like this. Man on the job. Yeah. Suppress the liberals. The liberals have almost destroyed the motherland at one time during Gorbachev's reign. They are a problematic and rebellious fire that would engulf the Union and everything good in it. Legacy of Andropov. Even through his leadership of the party, he was short lived, even though. Comrade Andropov left a huge mark in the Soviet Union. After all, he did start the process of perestroika, which almost destroyed it. However, sometimes we must look past the minor mistakes of our past leaders to see the bigger picture. Comrade Andropov was correct about one thing the part in the state apparatus itself. Being the director of the KGB himself, he knew that the Soviet Union needed more centralization back then, and that is exactly what we need the most now. We should continue these pauses while overlooking some questionable ones, of course. Men we can trust, so we can be sure that the KGB does, and Putin's men can be trusted and are good at their job. They prove their loyalty, so we will reward them with their trust. At least for now. Yeah, plus 0.03. That's not very much army speed, now is it? 
But oh well. Legacy of Andropov. Yuri Vladimirovich Andropov, a former leader of the Soviet Union, trusted and highly esteemed by the people, served as chairman of the KGB from 1967 to 1982. On November 12, 1982, at the age of 68, he was elected General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and held the position until 84. He made significant contributions to the Soviet economy, particularly through his work on Marxist theory and some problems of socialism in the USSR. Andropov emphasized the need for the thrift, rational use of resources, material, financial, and labor, and the importance of economic standards. He aimed to improve labor productivity and overall economic efficiency, fostering a vast creative space within the economy and avoiding economic manipulation through unfair methods. It was imperative to execute decisions once made and develop the economy to meet the general societal needs. Additionally, Andropov vehemently opposed and fought against corruption and embezzlement of state assets. In December of 82, he launched a campaign to curb corruption in Central Asia, the North Caucasus, and the Trans-Caucasus regions. Andropov empowered the Central Committee's Inspection Commission to conduct surprise checks on the assets of officials. Concurrently, his personal initiative to combat alcoholism in workplaces across the Soviet Union began to be implemented, as anti-alcoholism efforts garnered widespread support from the population as they did not prohibit drinking after work hours. From 82 to 83, Andropov's national policies notably reduced the immigration of Jews to Israel, and also allowed greater freedom of information while abolishing formalistic meetings, ensuring strict control over the content of published information. Despite his progressive stance on many issues, Andropov maintained unwavering commitment to Marxist-Leninist principles in the party and state activities. He defended these principles resolutely, uh, perhaps preparing for more extensive reforms that fate did not allow him to realize. I miss him already. I forgot to, but forgot to, but we also have uh, other comments to go through to here, too. So let's play this mod again, but plays America for a third political candidate. It's kind of interesting. Um, we're currently doing, like we said earlier, men we can trust, the KGB knows best, our secret services always know when, uh, how to detect traitors, and how to deal with them quickly. We can trust them as they are essential to our mission of fighting reaction. Uh, but yeah, we go over to America. Well, they've had their election, and this guy's here, Alan Keyes, he's got a nice smile. Well, that's, that's a pretty nice smile. Part of the Republican Party, I guess. I don't know who this is, though, but whatever. Uh, so it says, can, will we ever see a return to Extremist Ultimus? It's been a long time since I've played that. I think I only played it once, maybe, sometime. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, so it says, uh, what GPU do you need to play Hoi 4? He asks, he's got a 1070. That's more than enough. You need a good CPU to play Hoi 4, really. Even the Hoi 4 pretty much runs on anything, pretty much, at this point. Um, <clears throat> someone says, Pugo's Latvian. Wonderful will return home in this campaign. And uh, someone says, I want to see what happens when you choose to increase the influence of the reformists. And, you, and basically, you get Raikov as a leader instead, of course. Someone else wants me to play as Liminovs and National Bolsheviks. Um, so, yeah. Overall, yeah, not bad. But men we can trust. And the KGB, of course, knows best. So we can use better agency upgrades times, some more stability. We like that. Uh, old Guard retained dominance. <clears throat> with the invaluable help of the valiant KGB agents and the militarists dealt with one way or another, we retain our non-negotiable dominance over the entire party. You lose political power with this one, huh? Old God. Uh, CV, CPV, Alexei General Secretary. Oh, look at that. Communist part of Vietnam. A step forward. Pugo knew that his time had come. All his enemies and rivals had been cast aside. All the opposition has been silenced, and the party has been united under the banner of Marx and Lenin once again. The only thing that is left to announce it to it is to the entire nation and the world. Comrades, workers, and peasants, party officials, and all citizens of our beloved Union of Peoples, for the past year, our party has achieved some of the greatest successes this story of this country has ever had. Our beloved party, the shining light of our nation and the will of our people, it is as united as ever. No longer shall the revisionist and reactionary elements plague this nation, for we shall be the sword and shield that will cast aside all the enemies of the working people. No longer shall corruption hold back the progress of our ind industries. We shall be united as ever in this new world that is shaped around us. We'll march bravely under the new dawn of the one and final battle against the forces of capitalism and reaction. The Lord of the Great Union of Peoples and the shining light of our future, our Communist Party. As the last words left Pugo's mouth, Entire Congress hollered up in applause. Finally, the party had been cleansed of all its enemies, but still, there's much more left to do. Forward unto New Dawn. That is really but. The army is filled with Yazov loyalists. Most of the armed forces are in the hands of Marshal Yazov. This makes him a very suspicious element, of course. Trust him for now. The army can be trusted for now. It may confuse them enough for enough time that we can deal with them silently, and they won't even notice. The question of the army. Oh, compatriots, people of the Soviet Union, in this difficult and critical moment for the fate of our motherland and our people, we have a message for all the compatriots. Our great motherland is facing a dire threat. The reform policies initiated by Mikhail Gorbachev intended to ensure the dynamic development of the country and democratize social life has, for various reasons, reached a deadlock. Taking advantage of the freedoms granted and trampling on the nascent sprouts of democracy, extremist forces have risen up with the aim of destroying the Soviet Union, collapsing the state, and seizing power at any costs. A message from the State Committee on the State of Emergency. A historic message that was meant to save this country in a moment of extreme peril, yet not everyone responded. The Soviet military and security forces were mobilized to carry out this mission. However, 
At this crucial moment, things do not go according to plan. Columns of Soviet tanks advanced towards Red Square, uncertain of whose orders they were following, what they were protecting, or who they were fighting against. Yeltsin even climbed onto a tank amidst cheers, calling on the military not to fight against the people, accusing the coup plotters of acting irresponsibly and urging more Russians to strike. Meanwhile, the paratrooper forces led by Commander Grachev moved into Moscow with the task of controlling the White House, the headquarters of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Grachev appeared to comply with orders, but covertly acted otherwise. While sensibly executing the orders of the Ministry of Defense, he actually supported the separatists. Air Force Commander Shaboshnikov initially delayed deploying the paratroopers by setting unsuitable weather conditions, then redirected the plan planes to land at the wrong airport, preventing the paratroopers from assembling on time according to the plan, even directed, directly expressed support for Yeltsin. The reality showed that the military was losing serious credibility with lingering doubts about its loyalty. We have Yazov, who might still be loyal, but his years as minister, defense minister revealed his poor management skills and neglect of disloyal elements. We might hope for Yazov once again, after all. He was one of the key leaders of the efforts to save the motherland, or perhaps. It is time we learn from the old and emulate Stalin's approach with the Red Army. What should we do? Hmm. He was a lot of political power for that. Holy cow. Political focus. Who needs political power, apparently? Yeah, more weekly stability is nice. Construction focus. Diplomacy focus. Economic focus. Military command. Oh, South African Civil War. You cannot carry out a fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. Uh. Well, since this is new, I've never seen this before. Grim news reports are emerging from the southern tip of the dark continent. After several weeks of failing or falling, so failing to suppress riots and uprisings, the government of South Africa, in accordance with its general staff, has proclaimed a state of national emergency and civil war. They'll continue to wage war against insurgents called the African National Congress. <clears throat> the situation currently in the country is utterly chaotic. Observers inside the country report a heavy military presence in the streets and general panic among the white population. Most of the foreign investors have already left the country together with foreign ambassadors. While the UN status on several conf uh, on the conflict remains heavily neutral, several countries, including the USA, USSR, UK, Libya, Zimbabwe, and many others, seem to have already chosen sides their side in the conflict. Africa bleeds, but that's normal. The unstable truce. We're currently keeping an unstable truce with one of the most powerful and power hungry persons in the entire union. The truce will not last for, lo for long, however, just enough time that will draw the attention of Yazov. Interesting. Hero of the Union is next. So I assume we're losing Putin Bar. It's very high influence. Nice. Ooh, look at all the debuffs and debuffs we get here. Junichiro Koizuma elected as Japan's Prime Minister. Okay, nice hair. Interesting. <clears throat> so... Huh. Fabo Mbeke. Mbeki? Uh, two divisions. Now, I'm going to assume that America's going to get involved. And actually, this part of Africa has deserts, hills, mountains. They do have quite a few mountains, which I do not like. I think, how many planes do you actually have? Because I really don't want to send in. We'll send, how about this? We'll send in one thing of tanks. And we'll also send in one thing of infantry. Or mechanized divisions, I guess. And if that goes well, great. If it does not, then we are kind of screwed for that. Well, hey, we're here. And we have a war. How can we send planes? I want to send planes. Uh, especially fighters. Not enough intel. So dumb. But we do have a couple of decaf copy here too. Keep us nice and refreshed. All right, so where are you at? You need a field marshal, I think. No, I don't think I know you need a field marshal. Boop, boop. No fuel, but what else is new? Dressing for now. And the unstable truce. <clears throat> I don't even want command power. Here, no evil. Low men in high positions. You lose army XP again, which sucks. War support max planning, but you get a little more political power and entrenchment speed. Our only loyal man can be trusted if we plan to give him much power. This is priority number one to replace him to slow people with ones that won't dare to question our orders. Not for a second. Oh, good job, guys. Um, so I guess, you know, it's best to focus on just one giant front at a time. Boop. <clears throat> Partial mobilization. I don't want to do this, because I want to keep the political power just in case we need it or something. 2000 radio, nice. Happy 2001, everybody. 
Hope nothing bad happens in September. The hero of the Soviet Union, on behalf of the party and the state leadership, Comrade Pugo, political bureau member and general secretary of the party, has decided to bestow the title of hero of the Soviet Union upon Comrade Dmitry Tomilevich Yazov. Applause echoed throughout the hall, but Yazov could not bring himself to feel any joy. For weeks now, he even saw someone as politically inept as he could sense what was happening. His orders were being delayed, sometimes even ignored, and his subordinates were being transferred to distant, obscure places in the KGB. Since when have they been able to meddle this much in military affairs? <clears throat> Investigating for conspiracies and corruption, deceitful lot. Yazov rose from his seat, his steps weary as he made his way to the podium, forcing a small for the crowd. Pugo approached him lightly, pinning a medal onto his chest. Yazov saluted, but his eyes met Pugo's cold gaze. What a wonderful way to treat an old comrade. Pugo once again took the podium to continue his speech. This decision was made after thorough discussions within the Politburo. In recognition of Comrade Yazov's significant contributions, especially his outstanding service to the party's revolutionary cause in the defense of the motherland. Yazov's mind wandered, he no longer paid attention to Pugo's speech. What was he talking about? Mm, revisionism, corruption, same old, same old. Perhaps this is what they call a soft landing. Bugo was still decent enough to arrange this for him. Maybe it was time for him to rest. <clears throat> a vacation to Crimea sounds nice. Here, no evil. What do you mean the KGB has been found sabotaging some army barracks? What KGB? What are you talking about? Nonsense. You know, support the attack. Why not? Nice job, guys. Well, I guess you're going in here too. Look at that. And this is where it gets really kind of dicey for us. Oh, God. Just kind of hang out for now. Um, no, I'll see if we can extend this maybe a little further and just eat. I'll come down here. Oh, I guess it doesn't even matter at this point. Here, no evil. There's no evil if I don't see or hear it, right? The Nepalese, Nepalese massacre. Oh, how tragic. Oh, well. The army purge. The army's always been a thorn in our side, one that needs to be taken out. We we'll initiate one of the biggest purges to date. Bye bye, Marshal Yazov. We lose stability. We well, get stability. We lose a lot of war support, though. And manpower. Ooh, that's gonna hurt us for a while. No, I'll try to heal. Bit more organization, reconnaissance, uh, army leader cost, better army rego regain. Okay, you know, it's give and take, you know. It's always give and take. Hear no evil? Oh, did someone get purged? That might happen from time to time, you never know. African National Congress requests military support. There are applied fascists of South Africa at last at at last had the control challenge by the ANC in a June uprising. However, we'll still be needing to support to compete with the revolution or liberate complete the revolution and liberate the country from colonizers. Of course they can have our stuff. Absolutely. There you go. Oh, oh my god. Holy crap, they are moving so fast. I should realize that beforehand. Oh. Stuff we don't really care about too much, do we? Nice. And they're going to go back to Johannesburg. Ah, look at that. It's General Secretary Pugo. The time's coming to end the fierce fight, and that was a power struggle. Pugo will stand the th position, not throne, of General Secretary. Making his iron grip rule even stronger. Yeah, absolutely. No, oh, I hope this is not copyrighted, please. Nice job. Oh, Hugo's policies. Hugo has many ideas in mind about what to do with the Union. Many other decisions that he has to make. I don't make decisions about our domestic problems, I'll try to solve them all. Address the domestic problems. Well, we could continue going this way. Economic economy trees unlocked. Manage the economy. Our nation lacks the economic capital. Productive forces necessary to serve a continued opposition to the West. A problem that seemingly creeps closer through through a Brezhnev's time, only to explode through Gorbachev's. Chairman Yanayev has done efforts to slow the damage, but it's truly up to the chairman's Pugo vision to get a sustainable solution of the union's plaguing problem, and one of such that cannot be delayed for much longer. All right, so we got to bring this back. Doesn't help that we can't. We literally cannot deploy planes here. I asked for, because we don't have air superiority. Like I literally asked, we can't. I hate this thing. Am I doing it wrong? I could be wrong. How do I deploy planes here? Or at least not. You know, send planes over, because they don't let us send planes over. 
this a bug? I hope it's not a bug, but it might be a bug. So dumb. I must be missing something, right? Mechanized is not very strong. These tanks are not very strong either. Yeah, yeah, Why would we set it up like this? Main battle tanks. Why would we have infantry fighting vehicles? What if they infantry? Oh, I can't even edit these templates. God dang it. It's not fun. Sure, why not? And then after matters of the economy, matters of the military. The Soviet army needs to return back to its former glories, fighting the forces of the workers. Absolutely. Oh. Oopsie. Crap. Hmm. It's fine. Crack down Separatist, securing Crane. Hmm. Gain cores, little traitors, reunification talks. Oh. Crack down Separatist? Well, I'll lose it now then, I guess. Despite the years of destroying the Separatists and reactionary elements of the Union, there's still people who oppose the Soviet future and prosperity of our people. We will strike down all these fascists of the 21st century right back to the grave they crawled out of. I assume we're going to go fleet and beam, maybe? Maybe not. Let me guess, the comparison is really well. I hate... Ah, oh, lesson for the CPU, part one. Published by the party's ideological division. Why did the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, founded by Lenin, which led the Russian working class to overthrow the Tsar's rule and successfully established the first proletarian dictatorship, a party that led the people to resist intervention by the 14 imperialist countries, protect revolutionary achievements, and defeat Nazi Germany in the Great Patriotic War, declined to the point of nearly losing its rule status in 1991, despite its glorious history. In fact, mistakes and deviations have been occurring from very early on. We must mention the reforms in Khrushchev's era, aimed at undermining the Soviet Union from the late 50s, later referred to as Restructuring 1.0, setting the stage for the Reconstruction 2.0, or Restructuring 2.0, under Gorbachev. The role of the Soviet Union in World War II was distorted as Stalin was smeared in slogans like A State for All People and A Party for All People were introduced. Because of these mistakes, Khrushchev was forced to resign as General Secretary, but the needs of internal subversion had already been sown. Young party officials at the time, such as Mikhail Gorbachev, Alexander Yakovlev, and Eduard Shevardnadze, were heavily influenced by such opportunistic and revisionist ideas. As we know, the, when Gorbachev became General Secretary in 1985, he executed reforms exactly as Americans had hoped and planned. From 1986, Gorbachev used the term perestroika to refer to fundamental and comprehensive reforms in the Soviet Union. He emphasized, I draw a line between the words reform and revolution. The reforms we are carrying out are true revolution. Starting early of 1987, Perestroika became the main political slogan at the plenary sessions of the Central Committee of the Party. Gorbachev proposed separating the Communist Party from the Soviet government. More dangerously, the Congress passed a resolution on some urgent measures to reform the political system of the country, which the intention to amend the Constitution. In February 5th of 1990, the expanded meeting of the Central Committee passed a resolution to abolish Article 6 of the Soviet Constitution, which defined the Communist Party's leading role over the state and society, established a multi-party political system, and the position of President of the Soviet Union. On March 15th of 1990, Igor Gorbachev's proposal, an extraordinary Congress of People's Deputies of the Soviet Union, passed amendments to Article 6 of the Soviet Constitution. As a result, the content, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, as constitutionally the leading force of the Soviet state and society, was changed to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, along with other political parties, participates in formulating state policies. This amendment, meant legally abolishing the Communist Party's leading role over the state and society, recognizing political pluralism, allowing opposition parties. Multi party parliamentary democracy was established, and the most painful event was a 28th party congress declaring the move towards socialism with a human face, but never again. Let's get some better battle tanks in here, my god. Infantry fighting vehicles, you know what? We're using them, we're gonna use them now. I hate that I can't edit these. I should have sent the infantry. I knew I made a mistake. If you only have one division attacking, that's probably not for the best. Limited conscription. During peace. No, that's different. During war. No, oh, that's cool. Disarm nation. Well, wow. oopsie.
see. Naval command. Um, plus 0.3 naval speed. What do you do here? Destroy the Chechen rebels. A group of rebels who, to be correct, should be called Zel terrorists. These are the people who live in Chechnya, a republic in the USSR which, although insignificant, proves to be a real problem for a large country like ours. The Chechen rebels are the fiercest of all enemies of the new old, old, new old Soviet Union, driven by a strong Islamic belief in total disregard for civilian casualties. And for these animals to stop torture in the city of Grozny and the Caucasus republics adjacent to them, they must be destroyed like our wise marshal decided. Survival for the CPSU, part, part number two. Ask and answer ourselves. We find the solutions in the party's personal work. It was due to the leaders of a party, the traitors unprecedented in human history, who betrayed the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's uh, encephalitis, inducing poison, and other despicable individuals drained the party's strength. Paralyzed its one became a deadly bait that the party could not find an antidote for. Um, Lenin's warning about party building and cadre development came very early in his article, The Crisis of the Party, written in January of 1921. We must courageously look at the painful truth in the faith. The party is ill, the party is feverish. Many times, uh, Lenin sternly warned and demanded a resolute defense and cleansing of the party ranks from those hungry for fame and gain, the dregs of the old capitalist society. He called for the inclusion of a pro pro probationary period for the new party members to be tested before being fully admitted, which was a probationary period. However, for many, joining the party became an end in itself. As a result, the party became contaminated with despicable fame seeking elements, sycophants for them. The party membership card became a ticket to seize positions and climb the ladder of prestige. It's not surprising when there were sarcastic remarks. The party has a million members, but true communists can be counted on one hand. Thus, the gross violation of Lenin's principles of personal work is the second clause of the cri cause of the crisis that enveloped the party. This error led to the self degeneration of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Under Gorbachev, he broke the principles and ruthlessly dismissed officials who opposed the so called restructuring and pseudo democracy. In just over six months, Gorbachev restructured the Politburo and the Secretariat, adding eight new members, dismissed two, replaced more than 20 ministers, and dozens of part departmental leaders. In the first year of his term, up to uh, nine, almost 93% of the 150 district, city, and provincial party secretaries were replaced. The arbitrary use of cronies caused chaos in the personnel work, eroding trust among party cadres, government officials, and the Soviet military at the 23rd Congress. The percentage of re elected and consecutive term members reached 79.4%. At the 25th Congress, excluding the Central Committee members who had passed away, the proportion of consecutive Central Committee members was high as 90%. It is truly unacceptable for the leader of a great party and state not to be the most loyal and determined person to the party's goals and ideals. Democratic Centralism The golden key in party building, the most important factor in ensuring the party's combativeness and revolutionary nature, distinguishing it from reformist associations, was mercilessly discarded under Gorbachev in 1989. Also because of disregarding this principle, Gorbachev decided to remove 115 Central Committee members from the party's Central, Co Central Committee. Blatantly violating the party's charter, yet not a single central committee or Politburo member raised objections or fought back against this lawless act. We have failed Lenin, and turned on party struggle. Oh, look at this. After the events of 91, it became clear that a lack of ideological control and deviation from the party line had produced children of the 20th Congress like Gorbachev. There, the ideological work became central to all social activities, leading to the establishment of the Central Theoretical Department, which had built a system that did not allow any external interference from the leadership of ideological works by Central Committee, including from the security sector. Now, Gennady Zyognov, head of the Central Propaganda Department, and Nina Andreeva, head of the Central Theoretical Department, are two of the most important figures in the party. Though the ones shaping the party's direction are considered the most promising candidates for the future general secretary, however, despite being seen externally as sharing the same vision and direction, and internal disputes and disagreements have arisen over political, economic, and social issues. Oh. We're very much aligned with the KGB as well. Nice. And my god, we're trying here. We're bringing him back. We're so focused on cleansing, closing out everything else that. Uh, so much else we could do. Uh, hello. You know, give them a few days, maybe. Destroy the Chechen rebels. Um, is there anything we do here to help them out fixing this mess? Address the domestic problems. Well, uh, most of the problems that plague the motherland are domestic ones. Religious, economic, and many other types of questions will still be up in the air, which need to be decided. Well, I guess we'll see what happens. Part 3. The trampling of the principle of democratic centralism reaches peak in July 1990 when the Communist Party of the Soviet Union held its 20th Congress. 28th Congress. 
in the political port to the Congress. Gorbachev openly criticized the principle of democratic centralism and called for its removal from the party's charter. Consequently, the party's charter adopted by the Congress immediately abolished this golden key. Instead, the slogan of democratization was praised, which turned into a disorder which, with individuals, individuals standing above the collective. At many political bureau meetings, Gorbachev would bypass discussions, issue directives on his own, and consider them party resolutions. Now, how ironic given the slogans he often touted. In November of 1987, as the 70th anniversary of the October Revolution approached, the Politburo and General Secretary Gorbachev introduced numerous reforms. Instead of praising Lenin and the Great Revolution, they encouraged a re-examination of stories following Lenin's death, focusing on repression and allowing investigations and rehabilitation for those who suffered. Gorbachev's report of this event gave the green light to the process of self-decomposition and the opportunity for revisionism. The entire party was deceived by glamorous slogans such as more openness, more democracy, more socialism. Karl Marx once wrote, Ideals seize our mind. Command our belief and tie our conscience to them. These are the chains from which one cannot free oneself without tearing one's heart out. However, political ideological degradation can lead people to abandon everything. Marx also warned ignorance is a demonic power and that we fear it will be the cause of many more tragedies. Yet under Gorbachev's leadership, the party neglected the development of theoretical work and even exploited it to pivot ideological orientations. From the, pre from the 19th Congress in 1988-91, Gorbachev completely changed the previous theories and policies, stating that the Soviet's high-rise needed a complete overhaul and reconstruction. On January 6, 1989, he called the reforms a revolution. Countries should not interfere in each other's eternal affairs. A new political thinking prioritizes universal human values. On November 28, 1989, speaking with the editor-in-chief of Pravda, he clarified the function of the party is not as a leading force, but as a vanguard of the society. Now this will be a new political platform. Not remaining within the narrow interpretation of Marxism, Marxism is only a school of thought transitioning from models of authoritarian administration to the models of democracy. When the ideologies, activities, and history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union had been reviewed, disordered, and grotesquely twisted, and when millions of commun communists and sympathizers were in the condition of those suffering from a dangerous infectious disease, it now required much intelligence or difficulty for the imperialists to finally bring about the collapse of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, luckily it did not happen. Correct on resistance. Chechnya Ingushitya not only is a rebellious ASSR, but also harbors a huge amount of armed anti-Soviet and is radical Islamic rebels. We're going to need to crack down on the resistance before something bad happens in the region or the entire Union even. Oh, resistance level is 75. Having high resistance by the end of the operations will cause major consequences. Stability is 30. Having low stability causes resistance to rise up. Oh, shell resistance towns. This increases stability, decreases resistance. Let's get the capital. Well, you're all going to Grozny. Which I hope I'm saying right. Raid houses. Decreases resistance. Oh, wait, to complete. That's finished. Oh. Rebuilt destroyed houses. Uh okay. Oh, this is a zero. That's good. There's no resistance, at least. What else do we do here, then? Secure Ukraine. Um, Soviet armed forces. Fixing this mess. <clears throat> Rehabilitate Stalin. Question of religion. Continue Sovietization. Uh, I guess we're going to do the Soviet Armed Forces. We're the army of the people, and no force is greater than the combined forces of the Soviet people. Together, we've been all sorts of enemies, but our fighting capabilities diminish, and some extensive modernizations are in order. That's why I must work even harder to show the capitalists, imperialists, and fascists the glory of our armed forces in the factories and fields no one of the country has hope in us. Well, we're still going to the Soviet Armed Forces, uh, but I haven't seen this particular event yet, which will pop up in about three days after, uh, oh, just do. Um, let's take a look, see, this one, get better, do better, there you go. Oh, the woman of steel. The 70th anniversary of the October Revolution in 1987 marked the beginning of General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev's initiative to greenlight the reevaluation of history. Criticized leader Joseph Stalin and deny the victory of the Great Patriotic War. In the spring of 1988, discussions began to reassess and criticize Stalin, 
side lighting dissenting opinions and even engaging in vilification. However, within the Communist Party uh, of the Soviet Union at that time, there were others who did not remain silent in the face of Gorbachev's dictatorship. On March 13, 1988, the newspaper Sovietskaya Rossiya published a letter titled I Cannot Forsake My Principles by Nina Andreyeva, a lecture at the Leningrad Technological Institute named after uh, Lensovit. The letter condemned the materials appearing in the press after the announcement of the perestroika policy, as the materials criticized socialism, particularly Stalin's policies. She has also criticized a trend of rethinking history, pointing out that it was essentially a counter-revolutionary effort to alter the socialist Soviet Union. The article struck at the heart of the self-destruction and self-transformation trends. In response, the Politburo convened uh, an emergency meeting with the goal of addressing the anti-reform focuses. On April 5th, 1988, Pravda published a counter-article against Nina Andreeva, followed by similar responses from many other media outlets. Nina Andreeva's article at that time is still to this day is considered the manifesto of the anti-reform forces, precisely as Yakovlev labeled it in his counter-article published in Pravda on April 5th. Andreeva was forced to stop teaching physical chemistry at a university, but that was not enough to extinguish a courageous and steadfast woman, along with her like-minded comrades. She continued to mobilize and propagate to the people and resolutely oppose Gorbachev's clique. When the August coup took place, she was a strong supporter of the State Committee on the State of Emergency. At the 29th Party Congress, she was elected to the State C the Central Committee, and at the 30th Congress, she was promoted to the head of the Central Theoretical Department. For her, the principles of Marxism and Leninism were immutable, the future of all humanity, and she will ensure that the CPSU remains a party of the workers and peasants. I cannot forsake my principles, but formation of the African Liberation Front. It seems that South Africa cannot catch a break. Tensions are rising between South Africa and its neighboring countries over the issue of apartheid. Uh, this problem ultimately ignited an open conflict as these countries joined the ANC's African Liberation Front and declared war on South Africa. Military experts claim that South African military is in a dire state, but still has a slim chance of turning the war to their favor. As for now, these predictions seem like nothing more than a fantasy as the troops of Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Mozambique, all over here, uh, across the border to aid their allies in the ANC. South Africa's de facto leader, Constant Vilgen, has declared that South Africa will fight to the last minute bullet. Meanwhile, there has been no official statement from the newly formed African Liberation Front. The war continues. Oh, that's not good. And, whoopsie, whoops. Oh, my bad. Well, we got rid of that thing. My bad. I right clicked too hard on it. Um, oh, also we have end of operations in here, so hopefully, I don't, I'm not sure what else we can do here. Uh, I don't see any decisions popping up on the map itself. Um, hopefully it goes away, because it should. But now it's 9-11. Oh, well, almost 9-11. Now it's 9-11. Terror stack in the World Trade Center. Uh, I can play the audio, but uh, I don't want to relive that day. Kind of. Yeah, that wasn't a bad day for me, but still, it wasn't good. Remember the hours after September 11th when we came together as one. That was the worst day we have ever seen, but it brought out the best in all of us. The day in infamy. Terrorist attack in the World Trade Center. The world is both shocked and horrified as today's recent news with both the Twin Towers being hit by hijacked passenger airplanes, along with the Pentagon being hit in a plane crash being reported in Pennsylvania. The result of these attacks have been devastating. So far, almost 2,000 fatalities have been reported, with a number expected to grow as more bodies are found in the rubble. With the American public in uproar, American public in uproar, the President of the United States has sworn revenge on the perpetrators of this attack, promising to deliver justice for the lives lost. International reaction has been similar, with both Western and Eastern states uniting in a single cause against evil. Regardless, it seems that the events will be seen on September 11, 2001, will be echoed throughout the foreseeable future, a day to live forever in infamy. God, I remember when that happened. Uh, but now, lesson for the CPSU, Part 4. Lenin once warned, throughout history, the victories of Ak became corrupted by adopting the customs of the vanquished. This warning was issued very early in the 20th century, when the first generation of communists was truly pure as crystal. At that time, history recorded a true story about a people's commissar food supplies, Choruva, who fainted from hunger despite having access to thousands of stores of fine food. There'll be bread and there'll be everything, a phrase from Vasily in the film Lenin in October became a popular saying in the Soviet Union. In 1918, the Soviet Union, or government, faced a food crisis. Lenin proposed creating dining facilities to ensure comrades like Choruva were well fed. Yet, alongside this, Lenin personally drafted a party conference resolution to prevent inequalities in living standards and salaries, protecting communist members' reputation. However, over time, these principles were forgotten. Corruption and monopolies and privileges among officials became rampant, leading to a decline in cadre integrity and public trust, ultimately causing the rapid collapse of the fortress that was the Soviet Union. Lenin's dining facility modeled for ensuring that comrades tirelessly working for the people could eat while gradually transformed into exclusive places for high-ranking Soviet officials. These facilities offered luxurious foreign food, uh, luxurious foreign foods like French and Scottish whiskey, American cigarettes, Swiss chocolate, Italian coffee, Austrian leather shoes, British wool, German radios, Japanese tape recorders, and other expensive items scarce in the Soviet Union at the time. Soviet press sarcastically 
Note that for the upper echelon, socialism had been long established. For a long time, the Soviet government did not acknowledge the existence of corruption within the Soviet society. The term corruption was only used in the late 80s, a few years before the Soviet Union collapsed in 1980 itself. Uh, over 6,000 cases of bribery were identified, with the actual number being much higher. Organized groups emerged, such as the more than 100 individuals in the Ministry of Fishing Industry, led by the Deputy Minister from 1983 to 1989. Investigators uh, successfully prosecuted 800 criminal cases, resulting in the conviction of over 4,000 people. By the late 80s, corruption and bribery in the Soviet Union had reached critical and strategic levels and remained vivid to this day. With positions of power came privileges, and thus the practice of buying and selling official positions flourished. The prevalence of special privileges severely tarnished the reputation of socialism, creating a div significant divide within society. During Gorbachev's era, the privileged class not only sought every means to satisfy their personal indulgences, but also aimed to secure these privileges for their descendants. They realized that to legitimize their privileges, the capitalist system was the most suitable to legalize their existing benefits. Thus, they did not hesitate to openly promote the abolition of socialism and embrace the path of capitalism. Corruption is a capster, of course. Oh boy. Not ideal. Can you actually win here? Not without support from over there, so. You've got to hold. Ah, the new golden boy in the motherland's darkest time. True patriots are needed to act and respond to her call for help. Uh, Gennady Zyoganov is one such person, having worked in Agit Pop or Agit Prop and faced suppression and control under Yakovlev. There was a time when this agency seemed prior lives and merely a puppet in the plans of Gorbachev's dictatorial regime. However, as an inevitable truth, there, when there is oppression, there is resistance. Zyoganov, along with his comrades, stood up and boldly criticized Gorbachev, revealing to the people the true nature of the dictator. When the August coup took place, Zyoganov was one of the leading voices, supporting and mobilizing the people during the critical moment for the motherland. His efforts were duly rewarded, and at the 30th Congress, he was promoted to head of the Central Propaganda Department, becoming a close comrade of the General Secretary Hugo. For him, the Soviet homeland was a sacred and noble entity, a town when Mother Russia shone brightly and prospered the most throughout its tumultuous history. God has given humanity a gift, communism, the guiding light for the proletariat worldwide towards ultimate victory and the true freedom. And Zyoganov knows he is a faithful servant of God and apostle of communism. On the Siberian wilds, let's set sail. We can fix a mess. Uh, question of religion, sided with the church. Support from the church. Uh, I don't know about this one. Religious representatives in the Soviet Supreme. Zyoganov. Let me get more political power down here. Liberation through enlightenment. We lose political power, which I don't want to lose anymore. A new generation of communists. Andreev does. Influence increases. Continue Sovietization. Kornilizatsiya. Reborn. Renewed ethnic policy. Ensuring the rights of ethnic minorities. Brotherhood and unity. Unbreakable union of free republics. Great Russia has been sealed forever. An united national identity. Rehabilitate Stalin. A great legacy. The faithful servant of Lenin. Rename back the cities. A flawed leader. Denounce the crimes. <laughs> Praise the successes. Problem solved. <laughs> That's funny. 31st party Congress, huh? Because we got to do this stuff over here. I, I don't want to do anything else here until we see what this does first, so we're going to do something else. Um, fixing this mess. Gorbachev left us with a total mess of an economy when he was ousted from power, leading it to us to find a cure for the disease that the economy currently suffers from. We have been struggling to achieve, but for now we have the opportunity to clean up this mess once and for all. Do you guys actually win here or no? You know what? How about you guys just focus down here? Focus on Blumfontein. So when I'm invading uh, Afghanistan or in Iraq, the Brezhnev economic policy, the Stalin economic policy. Oh no, I don't know which way to go. Caucasian projects of communism, transformation of nature, no forgiveness for corruption, reintroduce, reintroduce MPE, begin mass centra massive centralization projects, invest in the military industry, more military cities, Ural military district, Invest in civilian industry, increase commodity production, tackle the prices, and steady as she goes. Well, that's good, good to get rid of. Or Brezhnev. Support the domestic policy production. Uh, Leningrad Industrial Oblast. Invest in the capital cities. Increase worker time. Begin uh, computerization of the economy, which I think is actually very smart to do. Um, computerize the military economy. Streamline the process. The project Melinia. Actually, it's not bad either. 
computerized the civilian industry, which I like actually quite a bit. Spread the ogas, more computers, more efficiency. Into the future. To get fixing the reformers' mistake. Well, you know what? Let me know what your thoughts are about all of these, because we have a lot of options here. The Soviet Navy, Soviet Army, Soviet Air Force. Well, we're gonna go with the Soviet Army. Invincible and legendary stands army. We stood at the gates of Berlin and soon we'll march to the corpses of all our foes. No one will oppose us if we ultimately modernize our equipment and finally find some new capable generals with fresh ideas. That's what we need right now. Nonetheless, a great force is coming and that's what I call power. Oh. oh. What do you mean failed uprising in Chichen Mountains? After intense fighting in the Chichen Mountains, we were able to restore order to the whole... Oh, okay. In the whole Chichen region and defeat the Islamist rebels. Okay, glory to the USSR. Okay, that's good. So it says failed, failed uprising. I'm like, okay. We did everything the game asked us to. Okay, that's good to know. That's actually very good to know. Great. Hey, we got something accomplished here. What is this? Soviet economic revitalization. Since so the turmoil than anyone coup. The Soviet economy has faced severe challenges, hindering its industrial and military capabilities. Through strategic investments and infrastructure expansion, we must restore economic strength to support the resurgence of the Soviet power on the global stage. Ooh. Invest in expansion of industrial base in the Ural region, boosting production capabilities and supporting military manufacturing. Upgrade infrastructure, enhancing infrastructure network in Siberia and improve resource extraction and transportation efficiency across vast field regions. Modernize agricultural sector in Ukraine. Implement agricultural reforms in Ukraine and increase food production and support the population and military. I like that too. Energy resources in Kazakhstan. Invest in the development of Kazakhstan's energy sector to boost oil and gas production and ensuring energy security for the USSR. Expand mining operations in the Caucasus. Increases mining operations in the Caucasus to extract more valuable resources for the Soviet war machine. Revitalize heavy industry in Leningrad. Focus on revitalizing the heavy industry in Leningrad, enhancing its capacity to produce machinery and armaments, uh, expand manufacturing in Central Asia, uh, it will boost Soviet economic growth and provide employment, employment, modernize transportation networks in Western Russia, upgrade transportation infrastructure in Russia, Western Russia, to improve the movement of goods and resources across the region, that's nice, shipbuilding industry in the Baltic, increase naval production and trade capabilities, and strengthen oil refineries in the Volga region, expand modernize oil refineries in the Volga region to increase Fuel production and ensure our state supply for the military. I like that one the most. We could use fuel right now. So, uh, what did I choose? This one, I like the city stuff. I don't mind the infrastructure, too. That seems pretty good. Ooh, yeah, that one, too. Infrastructure, I like that one, too. Military factors are nice, but I want the civvies and infrastructure first. Are we out of civvies? We still have four left. Look at that. But I think I it there. We've, we've been very successful. I want to see what the American response is in this mod to 9-11. Because I'm sure some of you viewing this uh, weren't alive during that time. Because I remember being in second grade, watching that on a CRTV. <sighs> that was a different time. But hey, if you enjoyed the video of us playing, uh, continuing as the USSR, as good old Boris Pugo, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as we we'll pretty much decide which route we're going to take. Thanks for watching. And have a great rest of your day.